Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Nursing Health Services and Policy Research Colloquium. We are very pleased to have a special guest today, Jacqueline Burgett. And the title of her talk is Interdisciplinary Approaches to Delivering Preventative Dental Services to Disadvantaged Children. Dr. Burgett is a clinician investigator in oral health services research with a board certification in pediatric dentistry and a PhD in health policy and management. She serves as an assistant professor in the departments of dental public health and pediatric dentistry at the School of Dental Medicine. Dr. Burgett's research addresses oral health disparities in children through health services research. Dr. Burgett's research has appeared in the Journal of the American Dental Association, Journal of Public Health Dentistry, Journal of Dental Research, Health Services Research, and the American Journal of Public Health. Her work also has been recognized by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, American Association of Public Health Dentistry, International Association for Dental Research, and the American Public Health Association. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Burgett, and I'll turn this over to you. Wonderful. Thank you for that introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And as someone in a non-medical health services field of dentistry, um, I love that I get the chance to collaborate with nursing. Is there an echo? I'm sure, I'm sure. Do you hear it? You hear it? Yes, I guess I do hear that. Um, um, everyone just check. Just check. OK. Oh, great. OK, I think it went away. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm so happy to be, to be here and talking with you at the School of Nursing. And one of my great joys in life is collaboration, especially with my colleague, Dr. Cindy Chu, who's here um, in the School of Nursing. And there's some just some wonderful projects that I've ha had the privilege to do over the course of my career that involve collaboration with non-dental fields. And that's what we're gonna focus on today. Um, okay, let's see if I can advance my slides. Okay, um, so a lot of people know that dental caries or tooth decay is very common. It's the number one chronic childhood disease, five times more common than asthma, and as most health conditions, you know, it's more common in disadvantaged communities. But I think the story that's often missing is that it can be very severe. And so we're not talking about you know, one cavity that you treat when you go to the dentist before it becomes something that hurts. Most children don't have that type of access to dental care. And the Surgeon General called this a silent epidemic. And now with the pandemic, it is a larger silent epidemic within a pandemic. And we call these COVIDs. And the increase in the number of cavities or tooth decay or dental caries in, in, in the pandemic has been, has been pretty alarming. And on top of it, we've been uh, hamstrung with our ability to treat the caries. So this is the New York Times drawing attention to how many preschoolers need to go under general anesthesia in the hospital to treat their tooth care or their dental caries. And this is a very lucky child. You know, a lot of children in our country do not have access to the operating room to do all of their dental caries and treat all of their teeth all in one visit. Um, and especially in the COVID pandemic, a lot of pediatric dentists have been shut out of the operating rooms because there's been such a backlog in other cases, you know, from the COVID pandemic, or it just uh, isn't profitable with the facilities fees and other health services reasons to keep doing it when um, there could be greater reimbursement from other cases. Um, so there's been a slew of legislation recently to try to continue access to the operating rooms to do this. And one of the reasons why this is such an important issue is because you can't really eat if you don't have teeth. And I know that sounds so simple, but you know, it's sometimes forgotten. And, and sometimes teeth and oral health uh, may seem ancillary or a luxury, but you know, your baby teeth stay in your mouth until you're like 11 or if you're male, sometimes even 13. And uh, it's gonna be a really long time to have an infection and an abscess in your mouth that can travel very easily to the airway. Um, so there's been some legislation in the past that was motivated by a death of a child that was preventable due to dental caries in the Maryland area called, you know, and his name was DeMonte Driver, and this was in 2007. Um, but he's not the only one who suffers very severe morbidity and even mortality due to tooth decay. Uh, so they may be baby teeth, but this is serious. Um, so there's uh, very long-term repercussions to uh, having dental caries. 
obviously if you have pain in your mouth and you're not eating and you're not sleeping, you're probably being pretty difficult for your parents and it's a rough time for everyone. And we know that from a lot of robust literature that if you are not able to eat and sleep, you can't concentrate and you may not be able to attend school or thrive in school, which has very long-term repercussions. And not only is suffering from tooth decay difficult, but getting the treatment is very challenging for children who are pre-cooperative in the age range is you know, under, under five and definitely under three, where you know, sitting and staying still for anesthesia, let alone treatments, is, is not something that's in the cards. Um, so we have to go to other methods like um, nitrous oxide, oral sedation, a lot of behavioral options, and then of course, general anesthesia to treat them. Um, so this may seem like a small cavity, but it becomes very serious very quickly in weak baby teeth, and then it becomes uh, an issue for treating it. Uh, when there aren't other options. So I just want to draw attention to our state. Um, we don't have enough dentists. So if you look at the purple there for the map of Pennsylvania, and this was provided by HRSA, um, every area in the purple is a dental health profession shortage area or DIPSA. And you can see it's over half our state. In terms of population, it's about half. So about half of Pennsylvanians live in an area where there aren't enough dentists. And that amounts to approximately 2 million people. So if there aren't enough dentists to see the children, then we're, we're not in a place where we can really address the serious issue of tooth decay and its consequences in our state of Pennsylvania, let alone the country, by working with ourselves alone. So the answer is really to work together. And that is something that has a precedence and that is something that we do here at Pitt. And those are the stories I want to talk about today. How do we reach all the children in Pennsylvania? How do we get to, uh, to prevent tooth decay before it even starts? Um, and are there evidence-based things that we can do? Are they effective? And how do we implement them? So we're going to talk about four things today. And we're going to take a very bird's eye level, just glossed over. And you're more than welcome to ask more questions about them. But I just wanted to kind of give you a, a menu of, of different options that, um, that I like to pursue in oral health to reach the children who need it most. So the first one we're going to talk about is um, working with education. And I love this one because Early Head Start is such a success story in the United States. You know, it's a uh, it's an early childhood uh, education program that involves the whole family. It is a federal program, but with very broad uh, descriptions so that it could be flexible to the needs of each community in each state. And I looked at the entire Early Head Start program in the state of North Carolina, and we wanted to see, are there long-term benefits to oral health? And not only did we look at that, but we also found that if you have a child in Early Head Start, and you compare it to a child not in early head start, they can get preventive dental care from different sources. And there was a very high level of preventive dental services. 81% of children um, received preventive dental care or received fluoride varnish, but the sources differed. And it's because you know, of early head starts regulations and their oral health um, requirements that children are connected to a dentist and have a dental visit and that their teachers brush their teeth every day with fluoride toothpaste. And so you see here that, you know, 81% of disadvantaged children receive preventive oral health services from either a medical or dental provider, but you can kind of see that the early Head Start kids received it from a dentist um, and, you know, the, the children who were not in early Head Start received it from uh, their, do their doctor or their medical provider, which, you know, we included in this could have been uh, any primary care provider. That could have been a pediatrician, a nurse practitioner, a DO, anyone that was in primary care for children. And this is really interesting because there are repercussions to this. Obviously, we want the kids to receive preventive dental care, and we'll take anywhere we can get, especially when they're young. Um, but we also know from the literature that if they receive it from a dentist, they're more likely to have a dental home and have a place where they can go to for dental emergencies and dental treatment if needed. And most parents can imagine, you know, how many times their kids bump their face. Um, it's tough when the first dental visit is for a dental emergency when there's uh, treatment needs and it's, it's a tough situation. It's wonderful when you can start out care at a, at a dental office when, um, when there isn't a, a, a treatment need. 
However, we also know that there aren't enough dentists to do this, which is why it's so important we have our primary health care colleagues um, delivering the fluoride varnish in medical offices. Um, so this is a wonderful story, in my opinion, of showing the combined availability of medical and dental providers to provide preventive oral health services and how important that is, especially partnering through an early childhood education to reach the disadvantaged families. Um, okay, so now we're gonna go to a really great project here in Pittsburgh. And this is with Kristen Ray in medicine at um, the Gap Clinic, which is on Forbes with Alejandro Hoberman and also um, uh, their team, their health services team, which helped pull the data. And fluoride varnish is, is wonderful. We know from Cochrane reviews and reimbursed by uh, HRSA and, oh my goodness, the United States Preventive Health Service Task Force all recommend fluoride varnish to prevent dental caries. And there's wonderful data about how fluor four fluoride varnishes by a primary care provider, including nurse practitioners, um, prevents dental caries significantly in children. And so this is another area where if we reach out to use the whole medical team and the broader health services, uh, that we can really prevent a, a disease that is largely preventable and causes a lot of pain in families. Um, so Kristen Ray led this. It was a six month quality improvement initiative. And the, the six months had a very specific, um, I guess topics and also programs based on themes about you know what the site did, what the leadership did, uh, what the experts that were you know that we brought in experts as well to talk to the teams uh, to do this quality improvement initiative. And this was um, this was through the Children's Hospital Pittsburgh uh, Quality Improvement IRB. And you know I just had so much fun working with this the, the pediatricians um, and the health services team. You know, not only revamping their electronic medical records to make it easier to use Epic to um, document and, and identify the need for fluoride varnish, but also in the after visit summary about making sure there was appropriate and correct um, post fluoride instructions. For example, you can eat and drink immediately. Um, and also that there was also, you know, uh, recommendations on how to get a dentist. And then, of course, supply chain uh, issues. Not all fluoride varnish is the same, and it's so important to know that there is evidence base behind each different commercial products, and some of them are not necessarily shown to be effective at preventive care, preventing caries, while others have um, incredible long-term data across many countries. And so making sure we use the most evidence-based fluoride varnish in our, in our clinics here in Pittsburgh for the primary care sites, and also that they um, were linked in with the dental supply companies to get an academic rate. Um, and then one th another one of these that I had really a, a good time doing before the pandemic was creating the video on uh, my and Kristen's children's uh, about applying varnish. And I had the luxury of being the pre-cooperative child. Uh, that one was mine. And so we gave examples of how to do the fluoride varnish depending on the cooperation of the child in a non-dental setting. Um, plus, uh, Kristen led these collaborative co uh, calls, learning collaborative calls, and we really gave feedback using data. And of course, having that interdisciplinary leadership team, the theme of today. Um, so it worked. And this is for children under five, so age one to five who are eligible for fluoride varnish reimbursed by Medicaid and other, uh, and other insurance companies by primary care providers, including the nurse practitioners at CCP. And we could see that before uh, the quality improvement initiative, there was about a 13% uh, of well visits had fluoride varnish and afterwards there was 40. And you can see it kind of really plateaus and really is sustained over, over many months, 10 months after the QII. And then what we're really concerned about is two-year-olds because this is an age when um, children may not be seeing the dentist yet. Maybe they have a hard time finding a dentist because there aren't a lot of dentists who may be willing to see young children. Or, you know, it's a lot of work to get your insurance together for the parents to organize having the dentist be associated with the child's insurance in order to get those visits. Um, or just, you know, getting through the crazy period of young kids and going to a dentist. So, you know, this is kind of a critical period where we really want to prevent caries. And it's also hard to find a dentist. So we really looked at the two-year-olds and um, we had a 
bigger increase in Freud Barnish application in the two year olds uh, using this six month QII at the CCC, CCP practice on Forbes, the GAP clinic. So that was wonderful. And it's so great to know that uh, what we know is effective at preventing dental caries is implemented here in our local clinic. Um, I just wanted to show that we also looked at practices that decided not to participate in the QII. So the black dots are things you already saw in the previous. Um, in the previous slides. And these are the eight sites that participated in this uh, quality improvement initiative for fluoride varnish. Um, and we also wanted to see, okay, is this a, a time effect? Is this a trend that is increasing everywhere? Or is this due to us? Did we actually do this as part of our QII? Um, and so here's the data just showing that, unfortunately, the 30 practice that did not participate in the QII, they did not have similar improvements in fluoride varnish application at well visits. And this is for under five and again, under two. Um, so the overall takeaway is that, you know, our six month QII works to improve fluoride varnish application and not just in the immediate and short term, but also, as we could see, all the way to month 33. Um, and it was continued and sustained in these practices, even after we, we didn't have as much immediate contact. And that, to me, is a real sign of, of lasting change and that you know, we can do something to affect implementation. OK, so any questions so far before I keep going? Feel free to shout out. Okay, well, I'm going to keep going and then, you know, feel free to interrupt anytime. So I like the Patricia Braun, who's in Colorado, she um, describes matching the, the health services with the population needs, especially for dental caries. And I really like using this model. And in the previous two examples, we looked at this bottom green area, you know, children who are at risk for caries, but in general, they can they can just do fluoride varnish um, and in that case we've worked with medical providers which i include for nursing and any any profession in a primary care office to do caries risk assessment fluoride varnish to talk about what causes cavities and then also to refer to a dentist so this could be done in my opinion for any child um, to increase access to preventive care outside of the dental office um, if People are willing and interested, medical providers, nursing providers, school nurses, you know, anyone can, can do the, the fluoride varnish and referral. But when there is a greater need in the population, when the children are at much higher risk for disease, if there are limitations to getting to a dentist, if it overwhelms the medical providers, the nursing providers, the school nurses, whatever the situation is, uh, if the needs are too great, sometimes you need more help. And so we're going to focus on this blue area where at the site where the children are receiving the, their primary care services, they need more than just a busy medical or nursing or allied health profession to, to just talk about, you know, it's important to not have soda and slap some fluoride on and give a referral sheet. Sometimes you need more services that are specialized in dentistry at that location. And that is when you include an allied dental professional co-located and hopefully integrated in a primary care setting. And that's what we're going to move to now, a full scope dental hygienist doing case coordination and behavioral interventions within a primary care site. And by full scope dental hygiene, I mean cleanings. So like with the, with the dental instruments, uh, radiographs, uh, caries risk assessment, fluoride varnish, everything you think of, but also a uh, very specific referral that leads to the treatments that are needed in this higher risk population for dental caries. And dental hygienists can even do silver diamond fluoride, which is a medication, a liquid that arrests dental caries. And they can also do, uh, you know, glass ionomer restorations or temporary restorations that just stop the caries from getting really, really bad before they can get to say the operating room or another dental provider to provide definitive surgical treatment. Okay, so we're in the blue area now. And we're going to talk about being in a primary care site, going to this dental hygienist or allied dental professional to get to a dentist. 
And this is here in Pittsburgh. Um, and this is, uh, we're, supposed, we're supposed specifically talking about public health dental hygiene practitioners. And this is the allied health dental professional that's here in the state of Pennsylvania. They, there are different names for the allied dental professionals that have uh, more scope of work and can work in uh, primary health care settings. And this is the one we have in our state. Okay, so we want to know if you add this dental professional who can practice in a medical setting, is it effective? Are the children actually getting the preventive services? Will people see them in the medical office? And are they getting children who need treatment to the dentist? These are really important questions, especially in Pennsylvania. Um, and this is directly related to recent health policy here in our state, where there's a lot of question of whether we should have these allied health professionals in the state increasing access to care, um, because there's the possibility that they could be taking potential um, patient care from dentists. Um, so if we answer these questions, we may know if they're increasing the, the the, the number of patients seen by dentists to receive treatment versus taking that away from them. Okay, so we're looking at Children's Hospital Pittsburgh Primary Care Center, or GAF, and there was a whole medical office, uh, an exam room that was revamped and changed to a dental setting in, uh, the, in, in the pediatrician's office. This was a lot of work. And this is done by Alejandra Hoberman and Brian Martin. And this was their brainchild way back in 2013. And this is a very unique model that is not replicated anywhere else in the country. So it was really wonderful. We were able to take data on it and show uh, whether it was effective. Um, and just to give a really good sense of how this integration happened, this medical dental integration. Um, so this is how the flow went. So the front desk was very well trained in integrating the PhDHP or public health dental hygiene practitioner. And they would ask families, do you want your child to be seen for cleaning by our PhDHP at the same time as their well visit? Or the, there were signs everywhere and, uh, and families could ask themselves if they could do that visit with the, and have their child have a cleaning and an exam when they came in or the medical provider, and this was a, a really huge push by the medical team at, at GAP, the GAP clinic, that all the, all the pediatricians and, and all the healthcare staff was on board to support this. Um, and then of course, no matter how they came in, the front desk scheduled those appointments, and that involved a lot of training on site. Um, and there was always someone who had expertise at the front desk to know how to schedule those visits using the health systems and the scheduling systems and to ask all the questions they needed for insurance. And then they'd have their visit. And um, there could also be, you know, people who the, the primary care practitioner saw on the clinic and thought, well, you know what, this person looks like they have something going on in their mouth, they need to see the PHHP and they could do an add-on visit as well. And at the PHHP visit, it's just like going to the dentist for a cleaning. They do a whole cleaning and an exam, radiographs if possible, if the child was cooperative, and if any treatment needs were there, they directly referred for the next visit to be a treatment visit. And this was only possible because there was a shared electronic patient record system and because the PHDHP was technically uh, an employee of Children's Hospital Pittsburgh Pediatric Dentistry. So this is such a unique model. If no treatment needs were identified, then the PHDHP still referred for dental care with a licensed dentist at Children's Hospital Pittsburgh. But they, um, the patient, of course, may ha always has the choice whether or not they want to do that, or and they're always welcome to continue just doing their cleanings at the medical site. So what I loved about this is the ability for the PhDHP to directly enter the visit appointment for treatment into the pediatric dentist schedule right there at the medical site. Um, and so the, the family always left with an appointment slip with the exact time and date and location of their treatment visit. Um, and that could be in the dental chair, it could be with sedation, so where they drink some medication and they feel really relaxed, hopefully, and um, they're able to have their dental treatments uh, with 
that extra evaluation of, of someone looking after the airway as well as someone doing the dental treatment and also general anesthesia. And there were two general anesthesia ambulatory care sites that the child could be referred to immediately. And this also worked really well because you often need, well, you always need the, the primary care provider to sign off that the child is able and is healthy enough to do the general anesthesia at different sites. And all that medical paperwork could be done right there at the, uh, at the medical office because that's where they already were. Um, so for paperwork, this actually was a little bit easier. Okay, so was it effective? Um, well, if you look at different outcomes, uh, you know, you could, there's definitely a story here to support that. Um, just by visits, you know, feasibility, were patients willing to see the PhDHP in a medical site? Uh, and here you can see that it started in 2013 with over 800 visits and that doubled by 2017. So that's a lot of children who are getting their cleanings and evaluations and referrals uh, to, to the dentist at uh, at the, the same place where they get their well visit. And then who are the children that are being seen? It turns out that this site saw a high proportion of children's public insurance and reflecting that the PHDHP also saw a, a high proportion of children with public insurance. And not only that, but it, it increased over the five years. So this is a wonderful way to target sites that have children who are at risk for not receiving dental care and at risk for also receive, having dental caries and getting them preventive dental services. Um, and some people may say, you know, we, we just went through, I think, our second revisions on this paper and there's only like four comments, but one of the comments was, well, why is it a big deal that children are just, the PHDHP is just seeing the children that are already at the clinic? And it's a very big deal because just because they're available doesn't mean it's acceptable for the children who may need it most. And to know that the children with public insurance um, wanted to see the PHDHP and increasing over time means we're really filling an access to care issue that has been persistent in this country and disproportionately affected children with public insurance. And there have been many attempts to get children on public insurance preventive dental care that have not worked. So this is not a given that just by putting a PHDHP in this office, you have children with public insurance getting preventive dental care. Um, that was a very important point for us to not only show, but show it was increasing. Um, and then of course, not only that, uh, but it was children who were of color, who were being seen by the PHDHP um, dis disproportionately. And just the combined story of the children who were not whites and also had public insurance seeing the PHDHP and increasing over those five years just really tells a very consistent story about how having a PhDHP at this clinic increased access to care for the most disadvantaged children in our area who really don't have a lot of other options. Um, so that was a very uh, successful vehicle to reach a historically underserved uh, population of children who very much could use preventive dental services. Okay, so the answer is, Yes, children are receiving preventive dental health services from this allied dental professional integrated in a medical setting, specifically children who are of color and have public insurance. And then also, um, we wanted to answer our second question. And this is, uh, this re recently came out again with Hoberman and Ray and Martin. And I, um, this was one of my dental student papers, Ian Ellis, and she did a great job. And we wanted to know, okay, that's great. They're getting preventive services. But what about getting to the dentist? Are they effectively getting to the dentist? And so here are the numbers. Yeah. Um, so about uh, 1,500 children visited the, uh, the, the public health dental hygienist in this one year. We just looked at one year. About 1,000 of them accepted referrals to the pediatric dentist, so about two-thirds. And of these two-thirds, about 30% actually completed the referrals and got the treatment that they needed at, at the specialist, at the pediatric dentist. And so you start to think, is 30% high or low? And it really depends on your benchmark. Um, when you look at a lot of medical referrals and how successful they are, this is about similar or a little bit higher than other seemingly non-urgent uh, specialty referrals like ophthalmology or dermatology, uh, but it is much lower than other specialty referrals that may be seen as life-threatening like cardiology. 
Um, so we thought that 30% was great. It is very hard notoriously to get children from the medical office to the dental office. Um, and so we also wanted to know who are these children who are getting to the dental office? What makes them more likely to go? And it turns out if they have cavities, so you know that was consistent with, that has an internal validity that makes sense. If your child has cavities, you're more likely to complete your referral for treatments. And also, um, this was just consistent across all the ages. It didn't matter if you were age one or age 12, if your child had cavities, they're more likely to get to the dentist. So there was a high proportion of children willing to accept a referral, like two thirds, and then also uh, about a third of the children who accepted referrals were, were, were going to the dentist. And this really was, uh, in our, uh, according to our benchmarks, you know, of, of all, knowing the literature of how challenging it is to get uh, families to the dentist, this seems very effective to get 30% of those kids um, who accepted referrals to the dentist. So we considered this a success by the allied dental professional to bridge the gap between the medical and dental settings. So yeah, 30% and higher for children who were also older, didn't show that, and, but also have dental caries. Okay, so let's go to my last, um, my last example today of using interprofessional uh, teams to address uh, the pre very preventable uh, cases of dental caries in our community. And this is something that has been a passion project of mine and been so much fun. And this is what I worked on with Dr. Cynthia Chu in nursing. And this is community-based. This is in the Homewood community at the Community Engagement Center at the Pitt CEC in Homewood. And what I love about the CEC is that it really is a touch point for many different professions to uh, get to work together. Um, you know, up here on the hill, we're all on Cardiac Hill, but you know, oftentimes we don't really get to work uh, with each other and we don't integrate or talk to each other and it's, it's not necessarily facilitated. But at the CEC, you know, we're all guests working towards a similar goal and it really is conducive to, um, to partnership and collaboration and it's been just one of the joys of my time here in Pittsburgh. Um, so what I love about community work is that you're responding to a need and a specific request by the community and this oral health was a, a very voiced very loud and clear voiced need from the community from the first community needs assessments in Homewood before I moved here to Pittsburgh. And um, there was even the strategic goals that was developed by the community itself to improve the health of the young people. And specifically at town hall meetings, they described they wanted one-on-one -on -one dental education, especially with children. And then we also double checked and we did our own community needs assessment and we asked community partners with long-standing work in uh, Homewood what specifically would you like and how can we do this to serve you the best you know because dental education and one-on-one -on -one counseling is very broad how can we target this to specifically meet the needs of the community and the community partners had wonderful feedback and they specifically said the top areas of need are tooth brushing assistance because that is a daily barrier that is frustrating and difficult and really challenging in the best of circumstances. And then also, when should children go to the dentist and how do you do that? Um, and th these are two very important things, prevention and, and getting treatments. And so we, I love that they gave us so much to go on and specifics and stories on how to do that. Um, and here's another thing for our uh, 11 community partners that filled out the survey. All of them thought that uh, families in home would would be interested in learning about oral health and uh, they even gave specific quotes about how important it was to include not just medicine but nursing um, at those well visits and saying that it's not just the dentist that need to have these messages but it's also every healthcare provider every well visit having the message that it's important to have good diet and good health and, and good teeth are important for good health um, and another one that I loved was it's important to it'd be helpful to increase networking with pediatricians to encourage a dental visit before the teeth erupts. So they're talking about early information ahead of time before there are problems and not just in the dental silo. Um, so that makes sense with all of us. You know, we know that children see the 
a primary care sites uh, four or five to five times more often than they see dentists at young age. Um, and so we wanted to respond by increasing the workforce of professionals who are well-trained and qualified to provide infant oral health education to communities specifically like Homewood. Um, and that is how we put together our team to train nurse practitioners, social workers, pediatric medicine, and pediatric dentistry on how to work in Homewood to specifically meet the needs of the Homewood community for infant oral health. And people may wonder, okay, why social work? Well, the um, oral health is, is determined like all other conditions, you know, it's a, by social conditions. Uh, the social determinants of health apply to dentistry as they do to all other aspects of health. And we are ill-equipped to do that without including social work to address those, uh, those social aspects. Uh, we are not trained, I think, as, as healthcare providers uh, to do the, the social aspects of um, the causes of disease. And we learned from our interprofessional training how essential it was for them to be a part of our team and to know exactly how to solve the issues that we maybe uh, feel like there's nothing you can do about. Okay, so let's see if I can go to the next slide. So we had uh, a two and optional third uh, curriculum for interprofessional oral health education. The first was didactic and we learned about what is the prevalence? What are the issues? Why is there barriers to care? Why should they care? Um, what is evidence-based as a way to prevent dental caries? And why is, are they specifically key to the solving this problem? And then everyone worked together on, uh, uh, on cases. And I came from a problem-based learning uh, background and I love working on cases, especially as groups. And everyone just had so much to bring to it. And it was just fascinating uh, to see how every profession had a different take on the same case. And, and thought of different solutions. And it was great to see the trainees talk to each other and really see the value in their own profession and the value in working with other professions to solve the situation that many children are in in Homewood. Um, and the second was clinically oriented. How do you actually do fluoride varnish in your workflow? And I just have to say how great the nurse practitioners are on this. Oh my goodness, they're so good at it. Like I, you know, it, it, it's scary sometimes to go in the mouth. Um, and everyone kind of has a different approach to it. And uh, the nurse practitioners that were in this training were just like so brave, you know, and just so into it. And it was just so easy to train them. And that was, it was, it was really wonderful. And I think it's so important, especially because, you know, a lot of uh, primary care offices, we train the physicians and then the physicians tell the nurse practitioner or a nurse to do it who, you know, just like to do, like when they're doing the vaccinations and there wasn't any direct training. Um, and that, so it's so important to train everyone uh, because everyone in the clinic and the team can be doing this. And then finally, a service learning visit with family and Homewood. And those, that, those are in progress as to really apply the lessons they learned clinically and didactically in the setting where we need it most. Um, so 90% of trainees, uh, wanted to tell someone else about a resource they learned or about something that they got from the training. And also 80% of the medical and nursing trainees fulfill the requirements to receive Medicaid reimbursement for providing these services. Um, so they're ready to go, well-trained, and can apply fluoride varnish uh, the minute they're graduating. 85% promote, want to promote children's oral health in their future practice. And three-fourths reported that they were uh, likely to provide preventive oral health services in their future clinical practice. Okay, and I just love, you know, stories. Um, I do mixed methods, I love qualitative research, and I think stories just really uh, say things in a way that people can really understand who didn't get to be part of the training. Um, so we really focused on Homewood, on, um, on the didactic and clinical training, and why we do this in communities like Homewood and the challenges that families in Homewood face and exactly how we would meet those needs. Um, so it was really nice that the feedback reflected the focus on Homewood. Um, social work had positive feedback, uh, medicine and nursing uh, also had positive feedback. And that was really great just to know that we reached all the professions and made it applicable and uh, appealing to everyone who has a, a critical role on the team. And then finally, what specifically helped in this training? Why was this training useful? How was it helpful? 
and it, I, you know, as an educator, I am constantly looking for feedback to see how I can improve as a teacher. And it was so great to see which specific strategies were helpful um, and the teach back. Uh, I have a lot of questions uh, and I require interaction in, in the teachings and apparently that was okay. I know that scares some people, but it worked out. Um, specific examples of how to talk about oral health and what to say if parents have questions and um, or if they're fluoride hesitant or if they don't, they're afraid of brushing their children's teeth and have never been in the mouth. These are all things that may seem simple that have really big repercussions for the health of the child. Um, and also we capitalized on our uh, Zoom and virtual mediums and used videos and, and all these other things uh, to, to make it as real as possible. Um, so this happens a lot where people are afraid and they need someone to help through that first experience to do it together. And I'm glad that that was enough because, you know, sometimes even doing this and trying to walk someone through it really step by step can, can not be enough. Um, so it was nice to see that people got over the fear threshold um, and really were able to respond to the hands on practice. And my most important uh, aspect of this training was, was changing how we think about oral health. And that is not a luxury. This is something required for basic uh, survival for eating, for talking, and um, to understand that oral health should be a priority from birth and does not separate from our GI system and, and our overall health, and we cannot be healthy if our mouths aren't healthy. Um, and so that was really great to have gone through uh, that so that some of the trainees really understood that. Okay, so in general, there was just a menu of options. There's education, there's primary care providers, there's co-location, uh, using allied health professionals, interprofessional community-based oral health education. Um, all of these are specific to the needs of the communities and it, it really is depending on what is going on at the site and who are the what is the population of children and what are the ways, best ways to reach the children. In one situation, going through education is the right way. In another situation, an allied health professional in a, a in a clinic that has a high proportion of disadvantaged children who are insured by Medicaid. Um, and in another way, we need to get to the children before they even interact with health professionals in the community. Um, and so I hope that, you know, this has broadened at least maybe ideas that you could even apply in your own fields and your own research of just how broadly can we think to reach the people that need it most. Um, and of course, in my opinion, starting early is the best, you know, creating habits versus correcting habits and getting the biggest bang for your buck. Uh, and we know that investing in the early, the early years has uh, so many long-term repercussions. Um, and uh, I think we should do this together. Yeah. Uh, so what are my next steps? You know, obviously I'm gonna continue working with Dr. Chu and working in the community and doing healthy, uh, and we now call it Healthy Teeth, Healthy Me. Um, but I also want to work more with uh, the pediatricians and really figure out why are they providing fluoride varnish to some kids, maybe not others? What are the barriers? And also, is there unequal application of fluoride varnish where the kids who may need it most aren't getting the fluoride varnish? And so my next job is uh, a health equity implementation grant, um, and I'll be putting an R01 in June to see what uh, to evaluate the implementation of fluoride varnish in primary care clinics. Okay, so I just want to acknowledge funders, NIDCR, uh, Robert Wood Johnson, UPMC, and National Library of Medicine. And um, if, of course, my um, collaborators and the 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 person in the middle there is Gary Rozier, who started uh, fluoride varnish by pediatricians and is the reason why it's now reimbursed by all 50 states. And he was the person who trained me. So it's a, it's a historical legacy to really uh, further the ideas that oral health should be a job for everyone. Okay, and this is my information. These are my kids in Ohio pile. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. I love talking about oral health. I love collaborating. Um, and it's been a joy to work with the School of Nursing and I hope we get to continue. That was great. Thank you so, so much for sharing that. It's really uh, a polished presentation. I think it just represents so much work on your part and, and very eloquently presented. So thank you for that. Um, time for questions. I was just checking the clock there. And 
I have several, but I, I don't want to dominate as the host. So I'll, I'd like to open it up to others on the call first. Would anyone like to jump in? I have a question. If you don't. <laughs> so, um, so first, I just want to reiterate um, what Dr. Burgett said about um, how this um, is so important for NPs. Um, this was something when I started here like a year and a half ago that um, I knew needed to be added into the curriculum because we started offering fluoride varnish at my practice and I wasn't really trained on it. And so this was such, I was like, kind of like writing a lecture about oral health and ready to incorporate it whenever I met her. So this was um, really something so important for our students to learn. And this, um, uh, it couldn't uh, be a better model for helping to train and then also help the community. Um, but I had a question about the PhDHPs. Yeah. So they're oversight. So do they require oversight by a dentist? Oh. Do they need a collaborator? Oh. So like when you're such a good sending question. them into the office, like what is their like oversight um, and like how yeah. like, if they have questions, what do they do and, and things like that? Mm -hmm. So this is oh, such a good, great timing for this question too, because this really just went through the state legislature this year and um, our research and both, both papers were sent to Harrisburg to cite their importance and why they should continue being as they are, which is with indirect supervision. And so all of their mind with a pediatric dentist, but they are not required to have a pediatric dentist on site. Um, and so that was a huge uh, issue for uh, the, the dentists in our state. And they really fought back in the state legislature and they lost uh, recently. And so we can still have those PhDHPs in at schools, at nursing homes, at primary health care centers without direct supervision from a dentist. Um, but of course, these are special PhDHPs, you know, like, for example, um, as you can see, that PhDHP, in my opinion, was practicing to the top of their scope for a, a specialist pediatric dentist. Um, they are more functional than, you know, my residents, you know, and um, so this is someone who's been doing this for over 25 years and who's been working for over two years. Anymore. They're the only dentist who's very hard to do and run the clinic at the same time. And so that we have to select very carefully which PhD. HGHP is, is willing and able to go into a primary care site and practice alone and, and be the champion for oral health um, and be willing to practice without direct supervision. So it's a team uh, decision. You know, I, I don't think anyone would send a PhDHP out just right off the bat from school. You know, this is something that you'd really work up to. Um, and, uh, and what was so fascinating was just like, how empowering it was, uh, you know, and I, I always love, I always love these stories for, for people who aren't medical providers, you know, to go into a medical setting and show how much you can contribute. It was deeply empowering for the PhD HPs who were able to do this at first scary, but deeply empowering and, and realizing how important their job is uh, compared to the pediatricians and for the pediatricians to recognize that as well. Um, but everything did have a technical oversight in terms of notes. And every referral, you know, when the child was referred, they did obviously check uh, to see the treatment. Because, you know, they're treatment planning, you know, crowns, fillings, everything, the root canals. Um, so they did check the treatment plans with the radiographs. And they were always right because they've been doing this a really long time. So they had <laughs> the radiographs and everything? Like, they did wow. everything. They That's did cool. everything. Yeah, because you have to come up with how much time for the OR or how much time for sedation. And so that you'd have to come up with a tentative treatment plan um, of how many root canals, how many crowns, how many filling, you know, and, and depending on where it is, different times for anesthesia. And, um, and so they would do all that, but they've been doing it for 20 years at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and we're obviously better at it than the residents. Um, so it worked out really well uh, for us to have them there. And it was, it was cost effective. They, they brought in a lot of money and it really helps on both sides for the, the clinic, the medical clinic and for the referrals to the pediatric dentistry. That's very cool. Yeah. This brings me back to my, I, I actually remember very clearly, we had one lecture in my undergraduate, my BSN program, you know, which prepared me for my RN license. And uh, it was on dental health. And, and I remember it so well and thinking, gosh, I never, it's like kind of embarrassing, but you, you don't really think about dental health uh, when you're studying everything else, <laughs> which is 
but put part of the all- GI system. I usually try to help medical providers, you know, enter it that way. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, that's great. Uh, but, you know, as, as a health services researcher with some policy focus, I'm reminded of kind of the structure in which we're providing care, mm. um, which is in part here driven by insurance. And when you talk about health insurance, it's usually not dental insurance. It's now you've highlighted some, maybe some overlap there, which seems to be a key step forward. I guess uh, any more, uh, is there any more integration or should we pursue something a little more comprehensive when we talk about health insurance? Should there really be separate insurances for these? Or uh, I'm not even sure what the history is there. I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, this is such a complex question. And it really came up during the ACA. Um, for example, you know, the Affordable Care Act included or essential benefits. Benefits. And one of the essential benefits include preventive oral health services for children within medical plans. And this again was built on the uh, cost effectiveness research and the effectiveness of fluoride varnish that was done in North Carolina and is now in all the states. And uh, that was the basis, the scientific basis for why it's important not for dental plans, but for medical plans to include these health services. Um, so what's interesting is like this, this exact that conversation happened and, and what was in some ways the downfall of, of the ACA and moral health and it's that the medical and dental insurances are completely separate and uh, there are dental insurance doesn't function in the same way as medical insurance you can predict that you'll need a cleaning um, and it's kind of like a prepay plan and it doesn't cover catastrophic issues it has a, a defined maximum. So it definitely doesn't function in the same way that a typical insurance plan would. And as a result, it doesn't do the functions of a typical insurance plan. And so combining a standalone dental plan with a medical plan doesn't really work because they're not meant to do the same things. Um, so that, uh, and also there aren't enough standalone dental insurance plans and companies willing to provide dental insurance to cover everyone. And so the people who, you know, were working on the ACA, they were like, oh, we'll just add dental, you know, and then they never even really talked to the dental insurance because they, you know, they didn't know to. And then, then they, then after, you know, it passed, they had to scramble because they were like, oh, wait, we never talked to them and they can't actually do that. They can't provide dental insurance for everyone in this country. And then they had to come up with exclusions where if you were, if it's available, then if it's possible and you can afford it, you can get a standalone dental plan um, in our requirement for having dental insurance. Uh, because it wasn't actually feasible to do that for everyone. Um, But there are systems that have integrated medical and dental health services. And those are the Kaisers and, you know, like, and and, uh, their openness, there's like group health, I think does that. Uh, And there's a couple of others in in the Northwest that have not only integrated co-location, but actual integrated health services and, and reimbursement for it. And in those settings, there's more of an interest in preventing caries, right? Because it's more expensive to the health system versus everywhere else, it's it's better for the dentist if you have cavities, because that means it's fee for service and you get more money for treating. So the incentives are switched. And um, in those cases, they focus more on prevention, as you would expect, and 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 aggressive prevention because it would decrease the cost of their dental system. So yeah, it's just really interesting how this all plays. Like every choice in health services directly affects the care I'm able to give and the options I'm able to give for children who are disadvantaged. Um, But it's really important to know the history of like why it's like this and how it affects everything that happens on a daily basis. And and maybe one day it will all go more towards integrated systems with uh, integrated health checks and 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 I can you know recommend the vaccines that are needed and all the other things for for my patients as well. Thank you. Yeah. So so interesting. I, I obviously there's room for growth here and, and improvement, but um, yeah. Thank you for commenting on that. I didn't understand actually that context with the ACA, even having studied the ACA to some extent. So. Thank you. It's that. complicated. You know, it takes, I mean, even dental people are just like, I don't understand how this dental works in the ACA, you know? So, um, but yeah, um, I see Dr. Uh, Finnamore. 
Yes, yes. Thank you so much, uh, Jackie, for this wonderful presentation. You know, there were uh, we were few but mighty on this this call. <laughs> Nine a.m. Yeah. I'm just so grateful that um, it is recorded because I think it has great to be shared uh, within the School of Nursing. I um, teach a freshman seminar on inclusion, diversity, and equity. And this presentation would be wonderful to share with freshman students from that per perspective and each piece yeah. of it. I had a particular interest in your topic because prior to coming to Pitt, I worked at UPMC Health Plan where I was the director of clinical um, programs and I was responsible for the Medicaid um, uh, product and chip products and worked very closely with our care managers and worked with uh, Dr. Deborah Moss from GAP, mm -hmm. with, uh, with Brian Martin, with Rick, Rick Salco in the whole implementation and had a chance to visit at Harrisburg and talk with Dr. Paul Westerberg about uh, Pennsylvania's dearth of, of uh, oral health for, for children. So this is just a great topic and I really appreciate all your work. It's so exciting to see the progression of what had happened at um, the GAP office because I was involved yeah. in the early days of that. Oh. And so it's, it's just so much fun. Thank you so much for this presentation. Oh, thank you for being such a wonderful advocate for oral health. I would oh, love absolutely. to pick your brain at some point about, you know, what it was early days, especially with GAP and, and you know, one of the things that Cindy and I talk about is, you know, obviously we train the nurse practitioners, mm -hmm. uh, pediatric nurse practitioners on oral health, but, you know, depending on funding, I would love to expand it to other, other students and trainees in nursing and other, the dental students, you know, I haven't even had a chance to go to the dental since we're just doing the dental residents mm -hmm. and medical students, you know, I think multiple exposures over time is, is required to, to really understand how easy it is and what a big impact it makes. You know, not everything we do is evidence-based with a big impact. <laughs> so when we have one thing like that, it's nice to capitalize on that. Um, but yes, let's stay in touch. I would love to talk to you. Thank you. I'd like that too. Great. I hope uh, you'll see in the chat a number of people as they had to hop out or just thanking you for the presentation and uh, you know, letting them know that they were leaving just to meet another meeting or whatever they had next. So, but thank you. I'd like to echo all those, all that gratitude and, and thank you for your presentation today. Really, really just enjoyable and great and uh, nice to meet you. Thanks for spending time with us. This was so much fun. Yes, let's, let's just stay in touch. And I really, really, really hope uh, that we continue doing grants together between dentistry and nursing. I think, I think it'd be great. Yeah, thank you. So. Oh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Amy. Bye.